All right, so I think we can get started. Um, this is the first open compute session at a UDS. Just last week, um, Canonical made an announcement with the open compute project. Um, the open compute project had us in their keynote um, as the contribution that we're currently making is through certification. Um, so we've already certified their version one specification servers. Um, and, and we're looking forward to doing what what they call zero day uh, certification so that once an OCP um, reference board is available, we'll put it through our tests and, and, and certify that product. Um, so I want to kind of leave this open and um, since we do have an entire hour, um, anybody want to make sure that we cover a particular topic because this is just stuff that I, I put and threw together. Um, but why are you here, and why are you interested in Ubuntu and the Open Compute Project? Great case. One point is the deployment on the servers. Right. Yeah. So that's why I, I'm interested in Open Compute, is, is they're trying to take the, the philosophy of open source software and apply it to hardware, which seems really interesting. Right. Um, and then from an Ubuntu perspective, once that hardware is available, making sure that Ubuntu can run on that kind of plane and easily deployable mechanism. Yeah. And he's such a fan, he's wearing a t-shirt. Yep, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> and the schedule lined up, but it could change tomorrow. And, and, and we actually have had, we've been at every single Open Compute Summit. It's every six months. They've had it three times. And um, so Antonio was our representative there last week in San Antonio. So maybe I can give a little bit of an overview of what Open Compute is. Um, so I, I put on here um, that uh, there are several groups that have charters, that have specifications, and they all have a mailing list. So I would highly encourage anybody that's interested in, in making sure that Ubuntu works well on Open Compute hardware and in Open Compute environments that you go out there and look at these various groups and join and start being active with them. So I, I kind of put them in order here of um, what I thought was probably the best area where we can make the biggest impact. Um, currently, there is no software track itself. There, there, there's not a software management or deployment track. Um, but software is starting to fi find itself, uh, its way into these other tracks. So the first one was the hardware management track. Um, yeah, before we get into that, can you give uh, whatever is public what the relationship is between Ubuntu and Open Compute and Canonical and Open Compute. I saw the logo yep. on the slides at Open I was there last week. Yep. Um, but it's not it wasn't clear to me what the relationship is. So far um, what I've seen in, in terms of the Ubuntu community it's it's been mostly Canonical that's been attending the Open Compute summits and participating. Um, that being said, there are um, other folks like Nebula um, and Cole Crawford that um, you know you could consider to be part of the Ubuntu com community certainly that are very active in the Open Compute project. Um, in terms of between Canonical and the Open Compute project, um, Canonical is a is a member of the Open Compute project. Um, when you become a member of, a, of the Open Compute project, you 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 signal not only that you're participating, but that you're contributing. And so um, what we're contributing right now, I apologize for, for that, is, is certification. So um, we're putting the resources behind, working with them to figure out how can we get the testing done very early so that these machines are pre-certified with the going to. Cool. Um, and that's on the server, the server, there's, there's open server. compute servers. Yes. So zero day certification on open compute servers with the Ubuntu on it. That is correct, yeah. Um, Which is pretty cool. And, and specifically, you know, the, the, uh, the reference boards that are, are coming out from, from the specifications. So when you become a member, I mean, I guess, I guess you have a lot more input into what actually happens. But um, I mean, you end up, since you're doing zero day stuff, I'm assuming you're getting early access to all these systems and things like that. That's great. It just means uh, that we are having a close relationship and discussions um, so that we know that the components that are being looked at uh, are going to work with Ubuntu. Um, right. It's exactly right. The details haven't been hammered out. The, the logistics of how it's going to happen haven't been totally figured out. Um, but we've been doing certification for years. Um, 
we have had our hands on a couple of V1 right. servers. They passed, so I don't really foresee any any difficulties in, in terms of that. So for companies that are looking to become a part of this, but like want to get their feet wet, but aren't ready to buy like you know a triple rack, you know, um, I mean, what's the best way to do that? Because you know we do a lot of distribution stuff. So it'd be interesting to know. Um, each one of these tracks, if you go to the Open Compute Project website, mm -hmm. they write up a detailed spec that's from GitHub. Okay. So if you don't, if you don't want to get hardware, um, the idea is that the, the spec, whether it's a rack, a spec for the rack, or a spec for a motherboard, or a spec mm -hmm. for a server, the spec should be detailed enough for you to be able to design a product and work around that. And so that's the idea of like an uh, Open Compute server. It has to has to meet each one of the spec guidelines for the server in order for it to be certified as an open compute. I guess server. the question that I have more practically speaking is can I go out and buy one of these because like my company is small enough that like we don't have a platforms department but big enough that like we would be interested in seeing whether this platform could work. Well De Dell and HP at the last OCP announced publicly that they're they have uh, they both got o OCP server right? Oh, okay so we just they're gonna look for that key. They're, they're gonna work on it. I don't think so. The people buying this are massive scale. Yeah. Uh, I don't. I, I didn't see a lot of small companies jumping on that. Well, with, with that being said, so there are several <laughs> ODMs that are more or less public about producing OCP compliant or very compliant servers that you can work with if you're a very large company. Um, the we're one we're talking about hundreds, not thousands. Right. Of servers. But um, uh, Synex has a department called Hype Solutions. Mm -hmm. um, they have an OCP website that you can go to and you can go online and you can buy. They, pu they publish the pricing. So it is possible to do that. And um, there are some data centers that will have OCP compliant machines and racks in them that you can go and buy from those data centers. Okay. Um, uh, hosted data centers. Okay. Um, so, so there are some possibilities, but yeah, the the it, it, sound like good ways. Yeah. So did I, did I answer your question well enough, Dustin? Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm good with that. Uh, you want to certify the hardware um, and the uh, who's the one runs well. Yeah, we we want to do more actually than that, but that's that's what we can do and we can do very well, and I think it's a significant contribution. And, and this one is uh, this meeting is really more about like how do we take it to the next level to to help out with the Open Compute project. Um, so I mentioned the hardware management track because in there is discussion um, around things like pixie booting, IPMI, um, remote uh, serial over LAN. Um, it talks about uh, software agents on the operating system, such as SNMP, the Open Compute Project um, is defining their own MIPS, um, so that doesn't matter where you buy your OCP machine from, they're all gonna comply to the OCP MIPS within the SNMP. Um, so I think that's a great one for people to take a look at uh, as a first stop and, and how to work. Um, the motherboard specification is actually older than the hardware management track. So the motherboard specification, if you look right now, it will specify, for example, um, that you need to be able to update the BIOS from the operating system. And specifically right now in the version 2 specification, it says that in order to be an OCP compliant machine, that you have to be able to do that from CentOS 5.2. Right, so I think that's something that we can maybe work with the Open Compute Project to make sure that um, we get wording in there that's a little more OS agnostic, um, or we'll make sure that we can do the same thing. Um, storage, coal is very heavily based in storage, and then becomes I think a little bit less interesting to to folks like Virtual I/O. Um, this group really focuses on um, the physical bus architecture of. How do you how do you get I/O to a particular compute node, um, and how do you virtualize that? So, uh, for example, you may have um, a bus with one or more um, uh, cables going to into this bus, and then you're able to actually virtualize many more NICs out of that and give it to particular compute nodes. So it's, it, the discussions really happen more on the hardware side of virtual I/O and not on the, uh, how it fix software. Um,
But no, just asking a question about who's publishing the performance specs. That's that's a good question. Um, I don't have a good answer for that. What I will say is that the primary focus around power in the Open Compute Project was originally at the data center level and to the rack level and not necessarily internal to the machine itself. Um, I think that's changing as we as we get like this high level view of the data center and, and how efficiently can we get power to the server. I think it's now just transitioning into now let's talk about the power efficiency of a particular machine. Um, I don't know if, where that would fall in any of these particular um, tracks, except maybe open rack. It's probably where you start seeing the most traction there. Um, personally, I think that Ubuntu makes a lot of sense in the Open Compute Project, and I think there's three primary reasons for that. Right now, the specifications are only for x86. They have an Intel specification, and they have an AMD specification. But the goal of the Open Compute Project is to make this architecture agnostic. Um, so ARM has been at the Open Compute Project. In the future, we'll probably see an ARM uh, specification as well. And Ubuntu right now is the only one that you know really works uh, across all of those various architectures. So I think there's a, a good story there. Um, obviously, the alignment and the hyperscaling story, um, Ubuntu hyperscales very well. That's exactly the type of environments that the OCP um, is, is going to do well in. Um, and right now, as I mentioned, CentOS 5.2 is kind of the reference uh, operating system, but with Ubuntu, the specification can have both the reference operating system and a supported enterprise operating system be one and the same. It doesn't have to be um, kind of a hodgepodge of, of, of different technologies or, or where you get the bits from. Um, I mean, are you guys looking to make like kind of innovations in some of these areas? Because I have to say, SMP is a finish to use. Maybe interesting to see something more interesting come out of how to monitor these machines. Um, so I am curious about that. Because you said that you're developing MIPS, which are SNMP specific. But, yep. Um, are there any other things going on to try to make that better, <laughs> so to speak? Um, it, it, we're, the Open Compute Project is trying to leverage existing technologies. Okay. Um, so there are one or two other existing te technologies. Um, I think that SNMP is, is, is the preferred one um, so far. And, and, and one of the things that they're trying to do is, by having their own set of MIPS, is to be very well defined in exactly what these things mean. So if you're, if you're managing and monitoring an OCP data center, these are the things that, that you know will work. You won't have to have a look in different places for different machines. Um, and it's very well defined that, uh, for example, um, if you're monitoring fans, uh, fan number one means it's going to be placed here within, um, or, uh, within the OCP compliant server. Um, and same for, for drives. So if you're, if you're monitoring drives, you'll know exactly which drive it is, whether the drives are laid out vertically or horizontally, or there's multiple rows, multiple columns, it would be very clear. Drive number three means this drive right. on, on this machine. Um, so I, I put in here uh, requirements for OCP certification. Um, BIOS updates I mentioned already, SNMP, uh, the BMC, uh, the preferred technology around that will be IPMI. <coughs> there will be a requirement to be able to power on a machine via IPMI, power it off. Um, soft ACPI events will not be part of the required specification right now. So there's discussion about um, should you be able to give an ACPI event to shut, shut down the machine nicely. Um, that's not going to be a, a part of the requirement. But if it is part of the requirement, then obviously the operating system comes into play to make sure that the operating system can handle those events. Um, and something else that might be considered is, uh, for example, rebooting, um, where the OCP has determined that rather than that being an ACPI event that can be picked up and handled gracefully, that they would rather see like an operating system agent that's running on the operating system that you connect to via like a normal port, and then you're asking the operating system agent, please shut down gracefully, um, rather than relying on ACPI. Uh, those are some of the things that, that we need to keep our eye out for. 
Um, and then a few things that I think would be interesting to try to contribute to the Open Compute Project is MOS, Metal as a Service, um, and, and Power Map. And I know, Dustin, you, you've had some discussions around that. Yeah, you said the word contribute. What, what's your goal? To, um, for example, make sure that if somebody produces an OCP compliant server, that it would need to be able to work with Power Nap. So that we right. that you know that if I have an OCP data center, then I'm gonna be able to use Power Nap inside of that yeah. data center. So I think the way it's written up here is probably a better way of saying it than contribute uh, useful technologies for OCP environments. I agree wholeheartedly with both Power Nap and Pass would really complement OCP environments. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the tenets of OCP is that everything has to be Apache 2 license and the default license is a molecule and interest of Software freedom has always been GPL v3. So uh, PowerNap is GPL v3. Uh, what code we have in MAS is GPL v3. So I doubt they would ever, well, I, I can't, I don't work for Knock anymore, so I can't speak to this other than just a conversation we had on email last week and talking about moving PowerNap to uh, Apache so that it could be contributed to OCP and that kind of so, the answer is no, and I didn't want to relicense it. Okay. That said, I don't think that really matters. I mean, if they're going to run Ubuntu, uh, you know, if people are going to run Ubuntu in OCP, a compelling reason to do so would be knowing that PowerNap works well, that Maz works well, that the rest of the Ubuntu stack works well. Right, right. So, uh, you know, I would say um, it's important to, it would be important to voice opinions in OCP where it makes sense. One of the things, for instance, uh, probably the, in my opinion, the most useful way to run PowerNap is when uh, the system actually supports, the server supports S3 suspend RAM. Like closing your laptop and suspending the computer. Most server hardware from IBM, Dell, and HP uh, and Intel does not support that today. Um, in, the, in, in OCP, they're start from scratch. They're designing their own motherboards and BIOS and, uh, ACPI and everything, uh, you know, the, the best thing they could possibly do for, for, for their power consumption and power now, um, and different than what HP and Dell and IBM have done, is have the friggin' server support system 3, or, uh, S3 suspend to RAM, um, so that a server can go down and come back up in a second, two seconds. Uh, but things like that. Uh, uh, Maz currently uses, uh, wake on land to wake machines, and it's a cheap, easy, dirty way of doing it, but ensuring that whatever OCP designs is IPMI compatible or ILO compatible. Or, I mean, actually, you know, ILO is a project technology from, from yeah. HP that has some open clients. If they're going to design an open platform, design a lights out or an IPMI remote management, protocol that's SMP compliant, SMP compliant yeah. for discoverability and, and remote management. So if uh, OCP decides that so one of the requirements will be S3 suspend to RAM, um, do you foresee us being able to take MAS and taking advantage of that as well as so modifying Yeah, MAS and, and, and PowerNap would, with a server that supports S3, would freak rock. That would rock. When a, when a server is not being used, uh, when a 500 watt server is not being used to take it down to about a watt of suspend just to keep RAM hot, and then uh, Maz be able to ping that machine back online in uh, a second, bring it back online, right. and you wait longer than that to refresh a web page. So with Maz, um, if you're not provision, if you haven't provisioned anything to that uh, machine, it's, it's turned off. We use Wake on LAN, or um, we we do something else to wake it up from suspend. Um, Currently, only Wake on LAN. Where, where does PowerNap then play into that story? So PowerNap is a daemon that runs on each system, uh, operating system level, that monitors a configurable list of monitors. Uh, input, output, uh, on physical device, so a keyboard output, it will monitor an SSH session, it can monitor TCP, UDP ports, or port ranges. Hard drives. Hard drives. Hard drives, input, output to and from hard drives, uh, processes, whether or not processes are running or not. And, uh, Cloud case, the process is KVM. If KVM is running, the machine is busy. If the KVM is not running, the machine is not doing anything. Right. Um, so PowerNet watches all of those. It's got a, data, uh, a set of 
data structures that basically increment counters, and then when all those counters are above a threshold that you've defined, the machine is now a candidate for, for a power app, basically. Yeah. So this, this little grace period elapses where none of those those triggers have fired, right. then the machine goes into a lower power state, where that lower power state can be still online, but offline some cores and minimize the CPU frequency and take okay. all, and the same thing your laptop does when you unplug from the wall. Great. We do on a, a, on a server, Etsy PM power D has a list of scripts that run in a true or false mode to enable and disable. Right. Um, but still that, I mean, you might get 10% power savings, uh, which 10% on 300 watts, 30 watts is, you know, right. that's something. Uh, that's not 98% power savings, which is what you could get if you could actually take the machine down off the line. Right. So uh, power net comes into play um, where you do have a service provision on there. You don't want to totally obliterate that service. Yeah, um, but you can reduce the, the power, the power consumption of that machine, right? And the beauty of, to me, the beauty of, of S3 uh, in a server environment, uh, coming out of a boot cycle or a hibernate cycle, can take minutes to boot a server. Right. Bringing up the SCSI bus can take 60 seconds. And don't even talk about hibernate. If you get 64 gigs of RAM and you've got to load all of that RAM from disk back into RAM, that's a five minute boot cycle. Um, yeah. But S3, we've, we've tested it in, in, in under three seconds, almost any machine can come out of S3 and it's serving packets again. It's pinging. Okay. So just as a note, I filed that session for tomorrow in PowerNet to discuss the integration with the Okay, great. That's all I have on the agenda. So again, this is this is the first session for Open Compute um, at UDS. Hopefully, we'll have more. Um, I would like to maybe find some actionable items that we could take, not outside of certification. Um, is anybody interested in signing up for any of those tracks that I mentioned? Could you help us understand what it means to be an individual con contributor at Open Compute? So I know they were having, there's a membership, and that's at a corporate level, but you can join the you can join the mailing list, but does one how does one get involved in computer but they need to actually become a member and fill out their things or just participate on a mailing list? Um, I think anybody can participate on the mailing list. So anybody oh, yeah. would be able to go and join the mailing list. It's read write, there's not like members get write access and non members don't. Um, the, the membership itself uh, is more of a formality than anything else in the sense that if you're contributing something that shows up in their repository, so there's a Git repository, that you understand that you're making that contribution um, under a certain license, for example. I'm contributing that license, or your, uh, like, is, is there a foundation or something that controls those? And that, yeah. It's a contributed CLA type thing? Uh, CLA. Contributor license agreement. So um, there are two agreements. There is. There is. So um, if you go to the opencompute.org, um, mm -hmm. there's a membership agreement and there's a contributors agreement as well. Do you want to give uh, Antonio maybe some key highlights of what happened last week at Open Compute and how you might see us <coughs> contributing? Well, the biggest classes were Ubuntu on zero day certification for hardware, which was good. Um, also, that they finally got their specs finalized for a server that Dell and HP actually took those specs and made a server and, and announced it and had that in a rack. Um, also that they're looking at the dimensions of a, a traditional rack and the traditional rack was based off of railroad equipment and obviously at that time there was no server, you know, there was the server that we have today so they were wondering why, why have these dimensions constrain our racks. So you know, I think they officially announced that they're going to be expanding that rack and changing the dimensions made an expect for other, other folks to follow, which I think is another kind of major theme. Um, also that we got Intel and HMD, those, both those folks are making um, motherboards that, that can be used in servers. 
Uh, so the Dell and HP machine, um, is that to the version 2 specification? Um, I'd have to look into that. I, I, think it, I think it may have been, but... And was there any talk about when like a version 3 specification would come out or... Not that I heard. I, wasn't, I, didn't, I didn't attend the specific tracks on the server track, I was on the hardware management track. Um, but it was nice to see that, I think a lot of folks were glad to see that someone actually designed <laughs> a server towards those specs, and I believe it probably was version 2 spec, yeah, with, with the AMD and Intel. So those were, because the, the project is fairly new itself, opening a few, I think they were saying, you know, it's fully got up and running as of uh, last year. Yeah, I mean, th there wasn't even a foundation that first yeah. summit, right? Yeah. And so it's really just been six months, um, re uh, really, because the, the, the second summit um, where the foundation was announced an hour six months later into the, to the third summer. So yeah. So it is very new. So being fairly new, I think folks are excited to see, you know, a spec be written, talk about the community, and it seems some tangible hardware. You know, obviously the governing board there too is, is Facebook, and I think on the board is also uh, Goldman Sachs is on the board too. Yep. So this is uh, some folks who really want to get the, the data center really you know, they're, they're looking at you know, real data center innovation there. So, those would be the highlights. I don't know, I could dig into any of those pieces, but on the hardware management side for, for, for Ubuntu, one of the interesting things that they're talking about is the idea of a disposable OS. So, uh, one of the biggest pain points for folks in big data centers is firmware updates. And a lot of times you have to go, you know, there's been a lot of admins that have to go out to flash car stick it into servers or follow on screen menus. So there's a whole idea of making a good spec that says if you're going to be a firmware update on OCP, you got to be able to provide us command line arguments that we can automate in a fashion, in a fashion and maybe provide us somewhere to download your most up-to-date um, firmware, whatever that may be. But having a system that way where a system administrator can easily flash all you know, the firmware on different types of cards and boards and, and a deployment that has thousands of servers. You know, it's not, it's not conducive to go around and manage efforts at scale is conducive. And so there's a lot of talk to having an OS that would have images in them that would be able to be deployed across all these servers, install the server, update all the firmware, and then basically at that point, the state of the server would be good hardware. It's working and the firmware's up to date. And so at that point, whatever deployment mechanism you have on that, but the White House OS, you wouldn't care about the OS at that point. The OS at that point is just a means to get the firmware updated. And so there was a, a, talk, about, a talk about that. So there was no concrete plans how to do that, but they were trying to talk to solutions on how, how you can solve that problem on a firmware level. Right. Um, so I'm imagining that they would just use Pixie Boot for that. You say, Pixie Boot this machine with this image, and you know that once it was done, that the firmware had been updated. Correct. Yeah, you would have the, the the technical details still have to go through as far as you fix it back how it phones home, which is the management module, which is the, is the management interface, or none of that had been designed. But talking to a spec to say this is what they would need to provide in order for us to do that, and yet a, a command line or a systematic way or or firmware updates that don't have to be manually going through the process, and that's kind of difficult because in some parts you need configuration, and there's so many different firmware providers, so. Right, an interesting problem to solve, but something that's needed on a scale-out environment that big. And, and do they foresee those uh, firmware images actually residing on the image themselves, or residing somewhere else that the throw AOS would boot up and then it would go out and query, um, here's all the list of firmware, and maybe an ID to figure out which, which firmware to pull down onto this machine? It was, it was both. It was very early discussions there, so it wasn't actually said this is where we implemented it. It was you know talk about actually tooling the OS to have it, but you still still having the OS small enough. Um, there was talks about having a uh, a tool inside the OS that would that would search and discover and then look for an archive to have that. So and it's also dependent on really getting the manufacturers of each individual piece of the board to be able to adhere to that and provide images that work to that. I mean, do, do they expect like this to be open source stuff or no? Just probably no. Uh, the system management piece or the firmware pieces? The flashing software. 
Um, some of the pieces, like the, the system management piece, that would go out and, and if, they, if it was, was going to push it for actual tools that would be on there, I think they would want that as part of the project to be to be open source. Yeah. Okay. So that part, yes. But you know, obviously, the firmware itself would be probably you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not worried as much about. But I think yes, I think to your question, it would be part of the project of developing that that tooling that either goes that sits on there and pulls from, or as part of or part of the OS that does that because that would have to be available. That's pretty interesting. It only sounds like it's really available to the biggest of the big. <laughs> so, well, I mean, which is in, exactly what you expect. in one yeah. sense, like it's well, been. Oh, I, 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 I hope not. I really hope yeah. not in the sense of, of open source. Because they're really trying to take the open compute project and apply, you know, open source philosophy to it. So if that was the case, I mean, if it's the only thing that's available to the biggest, I would, you know, that would, I don't think that falls the philosophy. So I, I hope it's, again, I mean, it's, it's, all, it's all early. It's very, very, very early in those designs, so I'm not saying well, that. Well, I mean, it's certainly true that anyone can participate on the mailing list, but there's only some people who, you know, have access to the actual hardware to actually make, you know, a system that means anything. Yeah. But I think we could take this and make it more generic than just the OCP as well. So, um, you know, it's very popular for uh, BIOS flash and utilities to use like a version of DOS, right? Um, and maybe we need to <coughs> figure out like how do we build a project around doing something very similar that meets the needs of, you know, the BIOS vendors so that, that, that you could say, you can now use this thing, which is maybe based on Ubuntu, um, to do the same thing and provide a better experience with you know, all the hardware that's enabled and functioning with it to um, versus something that's... Maybe you'll have better luck than, you know, the flash buttons the flash people have, but, you know, that's traditionally been very hard. I, I know that you guys have some of these people working with you, so I hope it works out better, but I'd what, like to see it. What are other people doing to programmatically update their biases and data so, uh, that's and probably one of the more compelling reasons to uh, use Dell ProBar. Um, one of the things that it does that Mass doesn't support is just because of the difference in the goal of the problem. It's just using, it's just using, I assume it's using SM BIOS. So, so it's kind of I think so, yeah. Um, so. I mean, Mass could, but I mean, the point of Mass is to install the Windows really well on any hardware out there. The point of ProBar is to install OpenStack really well on Dell, Dell hardware. Right. Yeah, so, yeah what I've seen in is, is mostly you will have an image you go to to flash the virus and then you uh, go to the install image under the And, and are you that, putting that one's the, uh, right? I mean, SFIOS utils is that specific to demo, actually. Yeah, that's what it mostly does, but I have customers who do um, flash the flash firmware for the family. Flash ROM is somewhat of a dangerous proposition because there's no one saying this will work in my there are only certain boards they test it with, and it usually doesn't work. And like servers are usually better supported than laptops, but um, mm -hmm. it is still very dangerous to use that tool unless like a vendor came and said, "Yes, we say that this works." <laughs> is not this BIOS utils a Dell project? I thought it was. I, I think it is. Yeah. It's hard to tell when you look at it. There's references to Dell, but it doesn't say tool for updating Dell server. <laughs> so I'm just not sure. I think they okay. they originated the project at least. And I, I'm just saying it's not. Like, Super maintained, but we had to get a backward fix because whenever some tokens were missing, you know, you can also use it to change the BIOS settings, you know, like that. Uh, don't make me hit F1 to continue if there's a problem. You can change that remotely as well. And Dell was specifically brought up there as uh, from a customer, because the cool thing about OCP is there was folks who were the vendors, but also customer data center folks. And there was one, one, one of the customer data center uh, guys who actually liked. Dell and then because of that. The world, they had provided a mechanism for them that they could, all the Dell hardware that you had in the shop, they would they would give you a local archive of all the firmware updates available to all the hardware you have. They would then have tools to go into your network, discover what hardware you have, and then be able to pull the appropriate BIOS stuff. And, and they really like that. Mm -hmm. You know, and that, that gets hard in a heterogeneous situation where you have multiple okay. vendors. Plus, those aren't open source tools. Like no, no. So no, I think that I mean, I guess the SM BIOS tool is something from Dell specifically. Yeah. Well, to, to what level is the hardware specified? I mean, they have a motherboard design. It seems like if everybody's running the same motherboard design, then you can have a common tool for updating. Absolutely. Yeah. That's the hope. 
that they can make it just and they yeah. have a clone server basically on that to be able to have all the same components and things like that. And have each vendor be able to adhere to a firmware spec or a firmware updating process spec that says if you're going to be on the OCP board, you need to be able to provide firmware in this type of level for half that API. So I mean in a more general sense, who's ensuring the compatibility of Linux with the hardware that is being specified here. So what level is the hardware actually specified? I mean, there's a motherboard design, do they specify what type of storage you're supposed to have? Um, the specs code, I mean, there's definitely the specs code deep as far as if you want to be on their like board design, or actually getting down to like the circuitry level, and then there's like a, a server like in that where they're getting more to like the component level. Um, are you talking? So like, there's the, also a certified. You can't have to certify your your system. You have to run it against that hardware. If you're operating, is that what you're asking? Yeah, yeah, like I mean, the NIC they put in there. You know, whatever whatever hardware is in there, who's guaranteeing that it is supported in their Linux? And I, I don't think there is right now. So I don't think the specification calls out a particular chipset for a NIC. Um, I could be wrong. So chipset. then it falls yeah. to Dell or HP right. or whoever. Like, no, no, it just says it has to, it has to provide X, Y, and Z function. Right. Yeah. And I also, like, I've read through this uh, V2 specification. I don't recall it saying that the NIP needs to work with X operating system. Um, the spec more provides, more asks for the core functionality. Like, the NIP must be able to perform 10 gigs, be able to be mounted on this type of board and have this type of connectivity. And so even that would be too. <laughs> the different types of vendors and such. So if Dell or HP goes and picks hardware that has no Linux support, then we're out of luck on that hardware until somebody provides it. Theoretically, yes. I would say, from my understanding, that's true. Um, because the only specifications I've seen is like, you know, with Linux BIOS updating, that you, you, you should be able to update the BIOS from Linux. And it doesn't really say, and the Nick needs to work. Um, I looked at, I mean, most of the, the, it does the say that the BIOS code should come from AMI, which is kind of interesting that it's tying it to a certain vendor. Yeah. So. Well, there's been discussions about possibly using something like Core Boot or <laughs> Linux BIOS um, in the BIOS as well. So, again, it's very early days with the Open Compute Project, and we can we can make significant contributions and you know alter the roadmap if, if it makes sense. The only thing I've been there was make sure that when they were talking about these things, they make sure that it's Linux compatible. You know, uh, most of like the, the sessions I was in is they the spec they said, you know, it needs to be multi OS available. And, you know, so that being, you know, whether it be a Windows machine or a Windows machine, they didn't say it to be, you know, an RPM based operating system or a Debian based operating system. At, at this point, they're just calling it Linux. But that, to a very good point is to be, you know, at least means to be available in the discussions so Linux can be represented. And I think in the data center, there's a lot of, and I think the data center folks that I've been with, a lot of them run the different types yeah. of Linux, but I mean, Linux is really prevalent. So I think yeah. Linux would be properly represented in that if they're billing to a server for those customers, for those data center um, people, knowing that Linux is pretty popular. Well, them. financial services, right? There's gonna be some uh, financial service companies involved in this. They all have some amount no, of- No, absolutely. But Linux is very well represented oh. within the OCP. I don't think there's a danger of something happening where it wouldn't work under Linux. Uh, and if you see the progress that's being made, you know, OCP v1 specifications, you know, those are specifications for Facebook. And of course, those specifications are going to reflect exactly what they have in their data center. Um, and then if, as we move down to v2, and I expect this transition to continue to v3, it's becoming more and more generalized um, in terms of not calling out a very specific version of a specific operating system release. Um, and even with that happening, Linux is going to continue to be well represented because all the board members there, they all they all use Linux. And they're all doing hyperscale and they're all doing hyperscale. And those are the people who started to do it. Yeah. A good question. Um, what are some action items that we could take? I, I think that I, I like this throwaway OS idea. And I don't think we even have to wait to have like a really good specification for about 
where do we get the firmware, how does the firmware get there, what do we decide if we flash this firmware on this particular piece of hardware, I think that we could start building something that should be very easy to do, is a very small image that can be booted from a USB stick or via Pixie boot that has something come up probably in a text console that we know also works with serial over LAN um, that will be either interactive or non-interactive in the sense of, you know, I want to flash this device and then provide that foundation so that um, when we do decide how do we get the image on to that or the from around the image and how it gets there and more the, what the process is for deciding which thing gets flashed. Well, and you could even integrate like flash ROM into it to make it a real thing. So, I mean, because it will work with some boards, maybe, maybe not everything. Yeah, exactly. Um, does anybody know of anybody playing around with something like that? I mean, we, we have discussions about, you know, recovery images. Um, does anybody know of anybody using the one to, I don't know, for flash and firmware or, or considering? <laughs> Not in this type of mechanism where it's being used as a uh, like a transport mechanism for the firmware. Right. But you know of situations where people already have Ubuntu installed and then from the server they're 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 flashing firmware. I, I was thinking more of a traditional sense of you know having your be before the OS and having to you know, go with the firmware of the files and either booting on one side or the other side booting from a disk or a CD or whatever and then going from that route. But having the ISO be able to mount point to go in there, right? Is I mean, I don't see that. So I, I know like in, in other Linux operating systems, um, you can download a package, you can install it just like you would any other package. Um, and what it does is it modifies the bootloader, reboot the machine, it then boots into the tool that will flash the firmware. Once it's done, it modifies the bootloader again, so then you're back to the normal boot process. Which, uh, where are you? I mean, I'm just wondering. I'm, I'm not disputing that. I'm just yeah. asking. Oh, Rel. Okay. Um, and specifically with Dell. Um, okay. So if you, go, if you go to Dell's website, you can download an RPM. So that when you install the RPM, the trick is to reboot, and then yep. it does everything and then flips it back. To yep. Like, interesting. Yep. So and the way I've always dealt with it is just uh, download flash ROM, execute it. You don't even have to reboot. Way more ideal because then you do like online upgrades and stuff. Also. Yeah. And, and, and the flashing does happen under Linux, though. It's not, it's not like it's booting into a different OS. No, no. It's just it's just that setting on the services, right? Um, so that there's less going on in the hardware. Yeah, yeah. It's making so. it kill. Yeah. I haven't specifically seen it with the Red Hat just. Yeah, booting, pixie booting to the image to be able to flash and then rebooting back into the, the normal. So what are you pixie booting into? Are you pixie booting into Red Hat as well? Or are you pixie um, booting into I didn't set it up, but uh, uh, I believe it was a different one. Okay. Basically, we have like a custom NetRD that we boot into, not necessarily for flashing, but for rescue things. Uh -huh. That is not Ubuntu, but it can be used for something similar to that kind of thing. It seems to me that there's still kind of this big unanswered question of is there going to be a common way to do it? So if there is, then you can provide one image that kind of does it in a fairly standard way. If there's not, then almost all it's needed is a tool that Dell or HP can take and insert their firmware flash flashing mechanism into a Linux image and pixie do it and stuff. It seems like there's kind of this... Well, I mean, I think there's a pretty easy thing that could be done. You could say, like, there's this firmware flasher called FlashRom. Just make your interface beat that spec, and it's a very simple spec. It's like, you know, an input file and, like, you know, dash w for write or something. So, I mean, that would, that would be pretty interesting because then they could just write their tool in a script or, or whatever, as long as it had the same command line interface. It would and, work. And, and if it works with Pratt's flash run, they can just use that and just dump it in there. And we could maybe build a tool that um, you pass a kernel argument to it, and the kernel argument is pointing to a URL, and that URL has all the firmware that you care about, has all the 
the database mapping um, for specifying which firmware goes to which machine. And that way the, the image itself never has to change, yes. right? Um, maybe you can create an image that has some stuff on it, but you can have this image and just point it to a URL. So if I'm in, the, in a data center, that image never changes. And if I want to update that firmware on that machine over there, I tell it to boot that image, um, and I pass a kernel argument with the URL pointing to, here's my repository of all, 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 all firmware. So, so that initially makes me feel frightened that you're going to download something and flash into your firmware. Um, I think you need a verification mechanism built in, some kind of signing or something, because I don't want a tool that's going to download something arbitrarily off the web and flash it into my So that's, that's a good question for you. Maybe, maybe the verification step is to a local repo that you have control over. So when okay. you put it into your local repo, you sign it, you make sure. And you can also filter to make sure you know uh, the firmware update pool that's available are only critical updates you want to send out to your machine. Because maybe there's a firmware update that says, you know, makes you run 0 0.05 watts cooler, and you don't want to have to, you know, go through the, the process of that update. Maybe the next firmware update says that you actually, you know, this is super critical, or, you know, it'll burn your chip out. So having a local repo to be able to filter what pool you're pulling from, and making sure that they're certified and, and legit. Yeah. It sounds like the kind of thing that a data center would want to do in the Yeah, for but, sure. Yeah, I mean, I think that's pretty straightforward, but one other thing to consider is that there may be reasons also to, like, even though you can download these, even though they're only going to be used in your data center, you may not have to distribute them in an unencrypted form. So there may be reasons to have the image, you know, have some secret that it uses to. In a local environment? Yeah, yeah, because uh, I mean, I've worked in environments before where, you know, we would push biases, but we would hope that they would be encrypted so that, like, you know, not just any employee could download them, yeah. you know, and, and look at them, right? And that was more or less, that wasn't as much for we didn't want the employees looking at them because like, we didn't think the employees were really going to have much of a problem. It was, it was, the problem was that, like, the, the biases that we were pushing like, kind of required us to do that because, mm -hmm. you know, they're controlled by any or whatever. Yeah. That's interesting because they're also talking to OCP and looking at the next level of, uh, of security is actually looking at people breaking into at the firmware level, you know, mm -hmm. and actually accessing the firmware level rather than at the OS level, accessing the yeah, firmware yeah. level and then and, and wrecking half of it. But, but your, your concern is about pointing to some third party external. That, that's level. one concern. I mean, I think another concern too that can be addressed similarly is that you want to ensure the integrity. Even if you're pulling it off of a local thing, yeah. you want to make sure what you pull down is, you know, Max is a cryptographic cache or something. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. that well, right. Like, you have your own CA, you can sign these so that, like, only things that you've approved can make it on your system. Yeah, I mean, you, it you, you're dealing at the level where you can completely break your machine, or if there's a security thing, yeah, I mean, you don't, you don't want to have somebody hack hack together some firmware that's going to give them access to your data center somehow or something. Another thing, ideally, that I've noticed in systems lately is they're starting to do more and more of like the dual biases, but you can only update one and not the other. So it would be interesting to make that available. To, you know, the update for both. Both signs. Because usually what happens is they'll deploy like some really old bias on, you know, on the backup chip, and then like the new one, you, you know, when you flash it, it, it's principally just flashing that one chip. And what happens when the computer comes up is there's a small bit of code that has to exist in the main chip, but as long as that's there, it will, or there's also some firmware support, but it will flip over to the other chip and execute from there. You know, if it doesn't, you know, have the right hash or something. So. And if there's the, the disposable OS has some, some, more, some more things to be decided about how they're going to do it, but to have it, at least, at least you know, as an action item, be on the management list to, to be able to see how they're doing that because so they're going to have to write the tool to something. It'd be nice not to have necessarily have to do a disposable OS. I mean, I understand like the problems that it kind of solves, but being able to do some of this stuff online would be a lot faster. Like being able to like flash my BIOS and like you know, and then only take right. one reboot to do it right rather than three and not having to have you know a bunch of external orchestration for like how my DHCP server has to be reconfigured for each of these reboots and all. 
sure. um, being able to just like kiosk the machine, you know, shut but, down all the services. And but there's a level of difficulty for that too, right? Because then you end up saying like you need one for this OS and this OS and this OS and this OS, whereas with the disposable OS. It's an open source solves, right? Um, <laughs> but I mean, no, it, it was, somebody may want to run Windows, right, in, in the OCP data center. Um, and the disposable OS gives somebody saying, you have an OCP data center, then here's everything that you need to manage that data center. And the, the disposable OS really fits in with that message. I think. I think the disposable OS is very useful, don't get me wrong. Like, it's, it's, it should be like the lowest common denominator. Yeah. But like, not being able, like when you're running a Linux environment to do this stuff, not being able to run those tools in your Linux environment. Like, I, I think that there's, there should be some mechanism like we're specifying like the OS even. <laughs> Like we should be able to say like, yes, you can run this this bare image if you want to do like Windows or some unsupported version of Linux. But if Canonical is going through the effort of you know, becoming OCP certified, should, you know maybe those tools should be able to run from front or whatever. And other people are kind of on that, their own. That could be an idea. In, in yeah. that track, yeah, I think that yeah. I don't I don't disagree with the need for that. I just think that there are a lot of use cases that are going to come up where people are like. Running Linux, I don't need this special reboot. Yeah, uh, that's a great idea. It's something that we should consider in certification. I mean, it could be as basic as like the SMP maps that you're defining. You can make sure that that software is mm -hmm. you know, part of the. Yeah, there's no reason that would you can't do what you're saying, or any of Linux servers that could provide that mechanism. Right. Because you're saying that could be an optional addition into that. If you're, you can have the OCP be able to do their deployment of hardware, but if you're also running Linux on your operating system or Ubuntu, right? And OCP, you can also take care. You could also update via that. Right. You're saying. Which would be very. I mean, it'd just limit the amount of downtime you have to take to do these upgrades. Because mm -hmm. I mean, a reboot's going to take you five or six minutes by itself. Then. So if you can have the amount of time just by only having to do one reboot instead of two, I think that's that's a pretty good thing. Mm -hmm. It's more important, I guess, the more I don't know, it's more important the more machine you have, the more important the last time. Think about that, I guess. Any other feedback? Round table discussion? What do you want to have happen uh, at the next CDS? Well, I think we should, you know, from Ubuntu's standpoint, we should see how the certification process is going. Uh, you know, how that's looking. Because, I mean, that's number one, is making sure that Ubuntu is working well on the hardware. And seeing where they're at on the disposable OS or how the firmware mechanism. And then also looking at the agents. From, from Ubuntu's perspective, I think those are probably the three biggest, biggest ways it can work on it. Is certifying on the server, helping it with the firmware, and then once Ubuntu is running in it, making sure it has an agents to be able to work with it in the data center. No matter, you know, whether it be, you know, while it's running and updating and performance monitoring, any of those type of things. And I don't know if this is necessarily a canonical thing, but I think that, you know, it would be really great if someone were to, you know, you were saying that there are ways to kind of like work around and get this hardware and make it easier for not necessarily like thousands of machines, but like, you know, if you have hundreds of machines, if you want to do like, like these RAM triplets appear to be like the, the lowest common thing that you would do, it would be really great if like, you know, if there were some manufacturer willing to work with take, people take, to do that kind of thing. Take a look. Yeah, I, I'm not sure what Dell and HP so now. Is a certified. But yeah. take a look at Cynix. <coughs> They'll sell you hundreds of machines. Okay. Um, I mean, if we, I mean, what I would like to see, like, because I've never played with this hardware, is like the kind of, like, we're in the position where we're starting to look at like buying hundreds of machines, and it would get to, the, it would be pretty interesting to be able to like qualify one of these machines and then say we should buy this instead, mm -hmm. yeah. and buy a rack of those rather than, you know, whatever else we've been buying before. And that's feedback could you give to the OCP? Because I've got that question multiple times. As, can I have a list of vendors, or can I have a list of people who are, who are making OCP servers? You know, well, I mean, it's just something where, you like, you know, as a, as a, I mean, I understand that I'm a small player, I get it, but, like, I'm not, I don't have any real But you shouldn't be excluded it. because you're small. Point. Well, that's that's what I'm saying, though. I mean, I have no incentive to, like, participate in Open Compute because, like, it's all abstract for me, right? <laughs> and, until I can actually, like, get some 
something based on it. And like yeah. I, I agree that like the, you know the, the vendors will probably use this as a place to like pull ideas from into their main lines, but it's like you know it would be ideal for to be able to just identify and say this is open compute and like I want one machine or I want mm -hmm. three racks machines. Yeah. You know, to um, at least experiment. What, what about if something was publicly available for you to experiment with, so it wouldn't be in your data center, but um, in, in the level of access you would have the hardware, I don't know what it would be, but what if we had like a, that would like certainly a cloud help. running on It would certainly open compute. help, but like from my perspective, like I need some, I need to be able to like show some way that this is going to help my company. I mean, it's like, um, I am interested in this personally, but I only have so much time. So if I can, you know, kind of jigger this into something that's like, this is, you know, for the company that I'm working for, then of course I can devote more time to it. Yeah. And and it's one of those things where I think that like something like this, if it, like, it, it, it's easy for a company like the size of Facebook or, you know, Google or something like that. I know that Google is participating directly, but um, right. but but it's easy for a company that size to like, you know put some really high power people on this. You know, for a company my size, you know, that has eight operations people, it's like, you know, having one person do anything with this when there's not going to be any return makes no sense. Yeah. And or but if I could turn around and say like, you know, um, this platform will be will, you know, not cost us any more and will make things easier for us to, you know, to deploy and whatnot and then I would be able to justify and the main side point that they're talking about with open compute is having a, a, a lower margin. So actually selling this, this hardware at more of a commodity based hardware and you know, making that as a big selling point for vendors. You know, how is our vendors going to be able to be properly about that? And their real selling point was to be able to take these specs, not have a lot of overhead in design and design and engineering and be able to sell as commodity harder to it. Right. So, which would be nice for and I personally it's my just opinion. I think that should be open. I don't think your size of your company should dictate, you know, you being able to do that. I think there's companies like oh. David said that David, <coughs> David, I mean that uh, like Cenex has, and like that. Like, I mean, I think that practically speaking, deploying these kinds of things, you're going to have to deploy like the minimum unit to be useful, and that might, you know, some people might. Maybe you can tear apart the rack triplets and make a single rack or something of these. But like, if you're not deploying that much of the hardware and the racks aren't compatible with your other stuff, it's kind of hard to That's true. to justify true. getting one machine. Yeah. You know. Mm -hmm. I mean, the reason why we want one machine is to prove that like it's good enough for the rest of our, you know, to, to start yeah. buying the rest, of the rest of our stuff. And um, but I think that before that point, it's kind of the other thing that kind of bothers me about this is like, oh, anyone can participate, but how many people actually have like the right experience to like, <laughs> you know? I mean, there's the Google SREs, there's the, you know, the. Facebook SREs, probably Amazon would be big enough to like really appreciate these kinds of and be able to contribute to these kinds of discussions, but like some, you know, random, you know, 